Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies and welcome to this latest Chassis Sim video tutorial. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a real treat for you because today it's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to bring you an introduction to Chassis Sim's latest toolbox, Chassis Sim Driver in the Loop. And in particular, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be going through uh, the launch presentation of Chassis Sim Driver in the Loop that I gave at Professional Motorsport World Expo in um, Cologne in November of 2018, in Cologne, Germany, in November 2018. So, without uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Okay. First things first, unless you've been living under a rock for the last 10 years, uh, the two major motorsport simulation activities that have dominated uh, motorsport have been lap time simulation and driver in the loop, sometimes abbreviated as LTS for lap time simulation and DIL for driver in the loop. Now, here's the thing though, ladies and gentlemen, the thing that has been missing has been linking lap time simulation with driver in the loop, but more specifically, ensuring the veracity of these links. But the other question that's always been hanging around um, driver in the loop, um, particularly once you exit the rarefied atmosphere of an F1 team or a factory LMP1 team, is can you use driver in the loop as a setup tool? And today, ladies and gentlemen, thanks to Chassis Sim Driver in the Loop, we can answer both of those questions. So, a quick introduction to Chassis Sim Driver in the Loop. The thing, ladies and gentlemen, that Chassis Sim Driver in the Loop brings to the party is it gives you the ability to go straight from the lap time simulation model to the Driver in the Loop model. Why can Chassis Sim do this? Very, very simple, ladies and gentlemen. Chassis Sim can do this is because at its fundamental core is a full transient 21 state multi body uh, MBD vehicle dynamic body. In particular, one of the things that makes Chassis Sim unique is the fact that the lap time simulation is transient. So, consequently, ladies and gentlemen, the step for Chassis Sim to go from lap time simulation to driver in the loop is just simply. Um, a matter of um, ripping out the autonomous control inputs and putting in manual inputs as well. And this brings me to the point that the thing that makes chassis sim driver in the loop unique is the fact that it's that the lap time simulation, the track replay, the shaker rig, and the driver in the loop all use the same numerical engine. And this, ladies and gentlemen, makes it a unique capability, which is why, later, uh, which is why, ladies and gentlemen, you can get correlation like this. Actu uh, um, the colored is lap time simulation. The black is driver in the loop. So you can see with speed, throttle, a steered angle, front dampers, rear dampers, lateral G and inline G. While it's obviously not going to be a perfect match because you've got a computer versus a human, you've basically got all the major points summarized there, ladies and gentlemen. This is the big thing, ladies and gentlemen, that chassis and driver in the loop brings to the party. Okay, in terms of circuit creation, it's not uh, uh, the good news is if you've invested, uh, if you've already invested money, good money in circuit models, do not panic. They can be imported. What I what do I mean by this? If we take a look at the circuit models that go into um, uh, applications such as R Factor, Assetto Corsa, um, Project Cars. All of them start their life as FBX files. So when you get a circuit, to, when you get a circuit illustrator or a circuit creator, they'll use a program such as 3 Studio Max or Maya to create these things called FBX files. These FBX files can then um, be imported into various third-party applications to generate circuits for your particular um, game or simulation capability. With Chassis Simp, we have exactly the same um, uh, path to take those FBX files and convert them into visual circuit files. So what do we do about the bump profile? Now, there are a couple of ways we can do that. If the FBX file already has the road undulations, then um, those so, uh, uh, then those undulations will be captured when you create the FBX file. If you're dealing with a more basic circuit model, do not panic. The great thing about uh, the chassis and bump profile toolbox is that we can use the chassis and bump, proof, pro, bump profile toolbox to create a, um, uh, um, a uh, to, to re replicate the bumps of what's going on with the circuit. And the great thing about that is it gets you about uh, it gets you about 90, 95 percent to a um, to a laser scan circuit with a fraction of um, uh, the exp uh, the expenditure. So we're, in a, we're with regards to circuit creation, ladies and gentlemen, we've got you covered. 
And this, of course, brings the obvious question, is what roles do lap time simulation and driver in the loop have? To do that, we need to understand the race engineering process. So it starts with driver feedback. We then go to data um, logging analysis, and if we've got them, we take a look at lap time simulation, uh, we look at lap time simulation, track replay, shake a rig simulation. Here's the thing, historically, there's always been that big unknown between what we'll deduce from here to going back to driver in the uh, 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 to um, driver feedback, driver in the loop closes that gap. And here's the thing: lap time simulation allows you to sort through the options. Driver in the loop will determine if the setup options are drivable, and that is the key, and that is the key role. And if anything, one of the great misconceptions of this business is a lot of people thought that with driver in the loop lap time simulation was made irrelevant. One of the things that we found in our testing is that lap time simulation and driver in the loop actually are complementary tools and they actually go hand in hand. But we'll talk about the ramifications of that um, a little bit um, later. Okay, closing the loop. Lessons learned in development and at the track. First things first, a couple of disclaimers. This is not going to be for everyone. Disclaimer number one. In order to be of use to a driver, the, dri uh, uh, the in order to use driver in the loop, the driver needs to possess the RC aviation gene. What I mean by the RC aviation gene, that is the ability to use visual cues to fill in the blanks about what the plant is actually doing. So, um, uh, uh, so one of the things that's been known in RC aviation circles uh, for years, and as a case in point, this is the former aerobatic um, pilot, uh, former RC aerobatic pilot of the moment, Chase Duzier, strutting, uh, um, strutting his stuff. But what has been noted for decades in um, RC aviation circles is that if you've got a good RC, uh, uh, if you've got a good RC aviation pilot, provided they've got the physical constitution. Um, to fly, they'll convert to a full-sized aircraft very, very quickly in a matter of hours. But conversely, the conversion the other way, if you've got someone who's flown the big planes and tries to fly the little planes, it's a much harder progression. Let me give you a case study. Uh, and one of the great things where driving the loop sort of lost its lay, motorsport driving the loop lost its way, was the belief that we could get around this. You can't. Let me give you an example of this. One of our beta testers, um, their lead driver, um, really, really good driver, um, very, very competitive, very, very fast. But in order for him to be quick, he actually needs to be in the car. He needs to feel what the front end of the car is doing. He needs to feel what the rear end of the car is doing. He needs the actual feedback that you cannot get, even from a motion simulator. But conversely, the second driver grew up on simulator games. So that particular driver does possess the RC aviation gene. They have the ability to, he, uh, that particular driver has the ability to take the visual cues and fill in the blanks. Now that's not saying anything bad about both of those drivers. It's just, that's just a reality of um, what you're dealing with. So that's disclaimer number one. Um, if you're gonna use driver in the loop, your driver in question must possess the RC aviation uh, gene. Disclaimer number two, this is not a magic bullet. From my chair, seeing what happened when Driver in the Loop was first rolled out, we're talking around 2007, 2008, everyone thought that it was going to be the magic bullet. And when things started to not unfold um, as planned, everyone obviously um, had uh, their doubts. But it boils down to the fact that this is not a magic one. The other thing that I cannot stress enough with Driver in the Loop, don't fall into the President Camacho trap. Now, for those of you who have seen the movie Idiocracy, you will know what I'm talking about. For those of you who haven't seen it, this is a scene of when things have all gone to pot um, uh, and plants are not growing and President Camacho proudly proclaims we've got the smartest guy in the world and he's gonna make them all grow in a week. If you think that this is what driver in the loop can do for you, then I hate to say it, OPB. Other professions or other pastimes beckon. So that is disclaimer number two. Lesson learned. What counts? The key thing to get right is you will live and die by your track visuals. And what I mean by that is it's absolutely imperative that um, your uh, that the visual model replicates the major circuit features and it goes exactly the same way. Now, you don't need it down to the nearest pine needle, but it must represent all the key features on the track. So as we can see here, this is a driver in the loop, uh, this is a chassis driver in the loop model. This is from the actual car. So as you can see, we've got the major visual features uh, represented. Of course, there are gonna be some differences. Number one, 
This was done in non-drought conditions. This is what happens uh, when you get an Australian drought, a drought. But the key thing is the key um, point, uh, uh, the key points have been represented. The uh, now also too the car visuals will be secondary to the track. That being said. The exception that proves the rule uh, is where the car visibility is limited. So we're talking closed cockpit LMP2 or LMP1 cars, or we've got GT3 cars with um, reduced um, vi uh, visibility. However, I cannot stress enough, you have got to get the, br the steering and brake feel right. If you do not have those right, you might as well not bother turning up. The other thing that's been found is that the motion platform isn't critical. So, and in, and in, typically with motion platforms, they're the great cherry on top, but also to be very, very careful in the fact that with motion platforms, it's very, very easy to get them wrong. But with our testing, we were all, uh, it was all conducted on static rigs. Lessons learned, tuning the model. Okay, a number of very key lessons we'll learn. Firstly, is adding the self uh, is adding, uh, one of the key things that, the, that you'll change between going from the lap time simulation model to the driver in the loop model, the major change is the addition of um, steering torque. That's it. Um, there's also another change we'll talk about very shortly, but we found that this steering torque curve worked very, very well. That initial slope controlled the initial um, steer feel. This um, controlled where the steering wing goes light and fuzzy, and that determines how, uh, and that post order region there determines how the steering wheel goes light and fuzzy. The other thing too, is that a lot of this will be determined on driver feedback. So for those of you who've got tire results, don't die in the ditch um, over tire, uh, tire results. Ultimately, our goal is to have a representative environment. So particularly when, you tune in, uh, when you're tuning in this, be dictated by driver feedback. Secondly, correlation. One of the great myths that's emerged with driver in the loop simulation is the driver in the loop simulation has made lap time simulation irrelevant. And during our testing, we found anything but. It is absolutely imperative that in order to use driver in the loop, the lap time simulation and the track replay tools must, must be correlated. You can't go past this step. Let me give you a little war story. One of our beta testers, um, we walked in, they just grabbed a um, chassis sim car model and we spent the morning, early afternoon going nowhere very, very quickly. So we stopped at 2, uh, two, uh, uh, at 2 p.m. I said to the simulator driver, I said, we are stopping, we are stopping right now because something is nutting up. So I got with the engineer who engineered the car, we walked through the chassis sim model, we stripped it all back to basics and built it back up. And this was the end result. Actualist colored simulated this black. Speed, throttle, steer, front dampers, rear dampers, lateral G, inline G. When we went back to the simulator the next day, night and day difference. But one key lesson though that was learned was uh, one key lesson that was learnt though the only uh, uh, the only change that we did with um, the uh, going from the lap time simulation model to the driver in the loop model was that we just added a little bit more front grip it was about five percent of my memory serves me correctly now here's the thing that actually illustrates a very very key point and a really big trap for young players when you are correlating your lap time simulation it's very very easy to be led down the garden path to get your steering correlation absolutely perfect remember a lap time simulation will always a true lap time simulation will always have the steer slightly under correlated the reason it will have it slightly under correlated is that the lap time simulation always knows where the grip is and it can always sense where the steering is going light and fuzzy. Consequently, um, when you're um, doing the lap time, uh, uh, doing the lap time uh, simulation, you've always got to be very mindful of that. And we talk about that at length in the, in the chassis and boot camps. And that really came to the fore when we were tuning in the driver and the loop model. So that's a really important point to note. Okay, chassis driver in the loop action. The first case study, World Time Attack Challenge 2017-2018. This was a really interesting case study because chassis driver in the loop was um, first applied to the um, open class, to the NA Autosport um, uh, engineering um, open class um, uh, entry. And what was really, really interesting was that in 2017, a uh, driver in the loop was more of a passenger than an active participant. The lap time simulation, the shaker rig still dictated um, the setup. But where um, driver in the loop was used in 2017 was more as a driver training tool. But after the 2017 event had gotten put to bed, 
I um, got together with the driver and we went through a, um, a tra uh, we went through an event replay. So what we did was we took the changes we did in uh, we did in the event and we ran them through the lap time simulation and then we ran them through driver in the loop. And what was quite striking, as you can see with um, the setups here. Um, you had the trends with the lap time simulation, and even though the numbers with driver in the loop um, had much more variance than the lap time simulation, the setup trends were exactly the same way. And that was probably a real light bulb moment to go, oh, hang on, we, you know, you know, potentially we could ask that age old question is, can we use driver in the loop as a setup tool as opposed to a um, uh, driver training tool? So walking into the 2018 event, uh, we again, the, we used the lifetime simulation, the shaker rig simulation to come up with a new um, spring and damper pack, uh, 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 spring and damper package. But this time around, what happens because we have the confidence now um, that um, we had the driver in the loop model very, very well correlated. What we now did was that um, we uh, we took the best options from the lap time simulation and we ran them through. Um, we spent a driver uh, a driver in the loop session and it was really, really enlightening on a number of levels. The first level was that we went for the 2018 setup with a new damper package. And that was a big step improvement with the lap time simulation. It also showed a very big step improvement with driver in the loop. And so we went through and um, we looked at various regulation changes and we looked at other bits and pieces. But he was a very, very big takeaway in the fact that um, a really big takeaway was that it, uh, don't just watch the data. If you are in a driver in the loop rig, just don't stay behind the glass. Walk into the driver in the loop rig and watch your driver drive because it was really enlightening to see when I would do a change to see the driver drive what was a quick setup, but you could see from the um, driver inputs that he was going to have a very, very hard time with it. But the key thing is this was probably the first inkling, inkling that we could solve the age old question that the trends between the lap time simulation and the driver in the loop were in lockstep. So, um, uh, so. The next step was to test this on another uh, 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 another car. So one of our um, beta testers um, was a front running LMP2 team. And what we did was we wanted to use, um, uh, we took um, the most obvious trends with the car, we ran them through driver in the loop. And so what we did was we would be doing setup changes that we would know that was verified, knew that this was going to do what term with the car and we ran it through exactly for the driver in the loop. Now, obviously because this is, Live race cars, live customers. I can't discuss setups. I cannot um, talk, uh, uh, and I can't um, the, uh, uh, and I can't discuss what uh, what was actually um, uh, uh, what was uh, uh, what was actually transpired, and that's all for anonymity. But what was absolutely apparent was that the actual and driver in the loop. Uh, uh, feedback was in absolute lockstep. That was probably that first point to go. Wow, we're really onto something here. So to make sure that it wasn't a fluke, one of our other beta testers was a um, V8 supercar team. And so we did a track replay of a um, particular event. So we went through and ran through the, uh, uh, through the setup change. And what we found again, the setup changes between actual and driver in the loop were actually in lockstep. However, there was something very interesting that happened here. The LMP2 team used a Fermo mechanical tire model plus that model had had a year or two worth of development. The V8 supercar team had just sort of gotten underway. So, so consequently, they were just using a 2D tire model. So consequently, the changes weren't as sensitive as they were on the LMP2 car. And that all boils down to the development in the model and the fact that the um, tire model hadn't had a um, lot of development. But again, the trends were absolutely in lockstep. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If we take a look, what we've got there, ladies and gentlemen, is a is a comparison between actual data and driver in the loop. Actual is colored, driver in the loop is black. Speed, RPM, steered angle, throttle, lateral, and inline G. Ladies and gentlemen, that speaks for itself. Now, a couple of things to know. The driver in the loop was slightly quicker than um, the actual car for two main reasons. Number one, um, there were some aspects of the bump profiling that needed to be um, to, uh, that uh, needed to be tidied up. And secondly, when you went offline, the circuit model didn't punish you. But again, it was. Uh, uh, but again, 
for what we needed in terms of comparing setup to setup, it was more than fit for purpose. So, some conclusions and key takeaways. Chassis Sim Driver in the Loop finally allows you to combine Driver in the Loop and lap time simulation. And it can do this, and here's the key thing, ladies and gentlemen, the numerical engine is the same. Also too, in terms of changes of this, uh, between the models, you're talking very, very minor changes. We're talking the addition of self-aligning torque and slight changes in terms of front tire grip, which really more results of probably overdoing steering correlation a bit. The other thing too, is, is unlike conventional wisdom that is out there, what you do with the lap time simulation, track replay, shaker rig will form the bedrock of what you do with the driver in the loop. The key things to get right, track visuals, car visuals if needed, the brake pedal and steering feel. You can get away with a lot, you can get, get away with a, a lot provided you get those components right. And as can be seen from the results, once the modeling is done right, the results will take care of themselves. Because the thing that Chassis Sim brings to the party is it finally allows you to combine both driver in the loop and the lap time simulation. And as we can see with the results, the setup trends, the car, uh, the setup trends, and the correlation speaks for itself. At that note, we'll conclude um, the, the presentation and we will catch you in the next Chassis Sim video tutorial.